19 year um, old. Modernism was I'm here in Venice in Italy at the Australian Pavilion for the Biennale and today I'm with Sean Gladwell. And Sean, my first question is, what was modernism? What was modernism? Well, I mean, I guess it's a tough one for me. I don't feel like I'm, I'm qualified to really answer it uh, from any other perspective but a very personal one. So, so here it goes. I guess, I guess technically it's a response to modernity on a number of levels, you know, from like these creative pursuits. So uh, I was always interested in how human beings um, up to this point where society becomes so kind of accelerated and complex respond creatively in whatever way through through the arts and um, you know um, different kinds of activity but I, I was I was always thinking that you know it was uh, this challenge for artists to deal with the modern world say um, in that industrial era or post-industrial now um, and with the the kind of challenges that we have with technology because for, for, for this this period of modernism you know it's almost like the world uh, is happening faster than our senses can kind of process it and art takes on this role where we're really having to kind of question that immediate environment um, through practice so it's a it's a pretty exciting phase um, I guess we've got postmodernism and then people come up with theories like ultra modernism it gets really complex I I don't want to go there all, all I all I know is that um, for me a kind of pre-modern thinking is like say maybe chop it, chopping some vegetables with a knife and then um, Modernism comes along and it's like trying to work out what, what a blender is, you know, because you, you, you need it to kind of happen quick and you want that smoothie and, um, yeah, there's a lot of people <laughs> watching, I'm kind of getting a bit nervous, man. Can you cut that out? We've got an audience. Yeah, do you want to just, yeah, that's a bit weird. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had people just rock in and crash your studio? This no, is kind of a meta. That would be weird, wouldn't it? If yeah, somebody yeah. crashed my studio crash. Yeah, it's like meta crashing. Yeah, meta, yeah, meta, meta, crash. meta studio crash. Crash crashes. Crash crash. Bastards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Now we're, yeah. We're, so we're, we're in Venice, and yeah. uh, you've actually ex exhibited here twice. Yeah. You've exhibited here at the pavilion, and um, also you were in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I guess. The first one was with Robert in the Italian Pavilion, which is right. now called the International Pavilion. And then yeah. the second one was obviously here at the uh, the fine establishments behind me. Yeah. The, yeah. It's apparently going to be knocked down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it's it's great that um, Simran has already sort of taken on this process of like, um, you know, starting to, to dismantle the pavilion. Like it's turned into this really quite interesting mm. convertible. You know, yeah. the, the top's off and it's looking great. But um. I, I'm interested in what's happening around the corner because I really love DCM, the architects that, that were given the uh, the commission for the new space. I think yeah. they're incredible. So I'm I'm excited for uh, for the pavilion and and what it will mean for Australia. You know, it's it's, it's a great. big black cube, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the canal yeah it's yeah. good. I mean, I guess this was always only ever meant as a temporary structure. So so mm. the fact that it was you know made on a shoestring budget and there was never enough time and it was a it was it's a substantial structure for what it for what it needed to do mm. um, but then it's great that we kind of were upgrading you know it's good although I do I do think that there's um, some characteristics about this pavilion that are great even though most of it is highly problematic I still mm. think that there's these there's these aspects to this pavilion that are kind of endearing you know the, like these kind of tough e idiosyncratic kind of um, sort of elements to this. I mean, I think Scott Redford was great. He was really on the money when he, he kind of visualized this place as kind of a surf shop. Mm. And I think that was a very creative way of looking at it, or a beach house, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and being on the decking here, I really feel like that's that's a pretty appropriate imagining for this space. So I, I guess the next, the next version will be much more of a kind of, you know, um, formalized space. Mm, it seems like much, a much more serious, 
uh, yeah. art space. Um, you know, I suppose following on from something like the MCA's. Yeah. Situation. Yeah, yeah. It's strange because I, I was thinking, you know, um, you have this. Um, playfulness with DCM's architecture you know like they, they they're, they're kind of postmodern, I guess in in that way that they've they've got all of these different elements crashing in on the same form but but it will definitely be more severe and formal than this space this is like really open and fractured and you know the, I guess the fact that it was built around a tree was wonderful mm. so um, I would always hear a lot of my um, you know um, friends fellow artists whatever they're complaining about this space but um but now that it's going that's at exactly at the point where i start m s missing it somehow even though it's still here you know it's it's like i i can i can see that there'll be just a different set of problems with the new space although i'm sure dcm will do a wonderful job it's interesting to see with some builds work how being exposed to the elements it's really kind of oh yeah to change the it's space yeah outside inside yeah. yeah yeah it's great I was thinking you know you, uh, of that interest that I always had with that kind of strange kind of inside outside sort of crisis yeah I, I guess you know like with Walter Benjamin and the arcades project and that idea that you, you had these sort of you know these experiences of being outside you, you were still inside and that interior exterior kind of crisis is definitely going on in there mm. I, I just think it's great because I was the first thing I thought was uh, how, how, how does the work uh, operate when it's raining which it does around this time of year you know you're going to get quite a lot of water in there and it's holding up pretty well you know I mean it's good I, I'm I don't know how your equipment's going to hold up yeah. if it starts raining but anyway <laughs> it's a bit of a dodgy day yeah 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 <laughs> dodgy in Venice yeah. I like yeah yeah now uh I recently was in London for the Royal Academy show uh, Australia and I knew your work was in there but I was uh, I was really surprised to walk in and see the very first piece in the exhibition is in fact your approach to Monday Monday. Tell me yeah. about uh, how you see that work figuring within the, the narrative that that particular exhibition presented. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess it functions as an introduction, and and that wasn't really um, anything to do with the work. It's it's really a curatorial decision. So, it's strange with these group shows, especially like a, a national survey, which is definitely the first time I've experienced this. Um, you you have to see the work in context, and you know, I was thinking, you know, I would I would never have known that it would be introducing like a, a story of Australian landscape art when I was making it it just certainly wasn't the kind of uh, intention for that work actually the the intention for the work was really just experimental play you know I was just trying to work out if that idea would would read as video so um, was that work was that part of the Manus Maximus work that was actually at Venice? No no it's actually a work that I made um, before this this exhibition, the suite of works that were shown here, but it's mm. very similar to another work that I mm. that I made called um, Interceptor Surf Sequence. Yes. Very very similar, same composition that we're chasing these this figure that's kind of playing on a vehicle in an open space. So it, it's actually really just a different iteration of that that idea that that kind of came through in approach to Monday Monday. So yeah, it was. I mean, the RA show is. I'm still. I've only just sort of. We've only just opened the show, so it's probably going to take me a bit of time to process it. Usually, it takes me a long time to work out what the hell's going on um, mm. with any of these shows. But um, yeah, no, it's um, it's an interesting problem that artists have. I think when you find your work neighbouring all of these other works, and and um, you know th that that will obviously affect the reading of the work. Yeah, I noticed in the text panel that was next to your work that uh, mm. it's framed within the Aboriginal landscape as well, which then kind of leads you into that first room where mm -hmm. you have the Emily Kanware uh, yeah. on the wall. So it's, t tell me a little bit about um, what that landscape means in terms of, for, for you in terms of Australia. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, guess I was um, always interested in, in producing work that was very much about Australia. That there was no uh, question about where the location was. That that was something that interested me in Australian 
art history and cinema and then I had given myself so many references I don't even think I gave them to myself I think that we just get them as this kind of ambient background about the interior and the outback and all of these sort of tropes that are associated with, with that that location that it wasn't long before I wanted to experience it directly myself you know and and the strange thing was that I had gone through art school and even traveled overseas to deserts around the world because I'm obsessed with deserts like um, Northwest India in Rajasthan or the the Sinai or whatever um, but I had never really explored the Australian interior I'd seen some you know some some arid space but I had never really been into these these kind of outback spaces that are kind of more cliche desert spaces you know for um, for like Australian media or whatever we project overseas so I, I really wanted to, to to situate the work in in some quintessentially Australian sort of um, desert space and uh, and that's that's really what led me out there so I, I guess I can't really you know I can't really argue with the 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 work being about the Australian landscape because that's that's really what motivated me it's really the impetus to that that whole series of work not just the approach to Monday Monday and um, but also I mean there were these interests that I had with popular culture you know it wasn't all about this sort of romantic um, longing for the desert as a sort of city dweller or a suburbanite or I, I sort of I think I already had this kind of fantasy about the desert through Mad Max and yeah. other fine fine films like Razorback which was shot out in Broken Hill mm. and um, you know that this is uh, that's filmed uh, the approach to Monday Monday is near Silverton isn't it? yeah so you go down yeah yeah and the locals even call this area the Outback Hollywood you know that oh, there's yeah. there's just so much representation of that space in cinema and also in advertising there's so many 30 second advertising spots that use um, a few spots around this area it's it's extraordinary it, it's and also it's it's kind of also called like the, fo the the doorstep to the desert because it's actually quite close to Broken Hill which is of course a huge mining town mm. and it has you know all of the modern conveniences you you'd want as a tourist but as soon as you get past Silverton you are really in this kind of parched open landscape and it's extraordinary to feel that change when you're moving from Broken Hill to the very small kind of um, ex-mining town of Silverton it's really mm. a ghost town now and then beyond beyond Silverton you are you are really in what what feels like open desert space and and, and I, I just wanted to somehow stage a, a few experiments in those spaces and see if they worked and one of them was approached to Monday Monday yeah so that actually preempted uh, the Maddis Maximus yeah. yeah yeah oh it was it was kind of a part of the first version of those works and then mm. I would elaborate them um, later I'd sort of keep working on them and changing the vehicles and the locations and kind of like just reworking a painting or something. I, I just couldn't let the project go. I kind of became obsessed with the lo location actually. Mm. Um, and it was a, an excuse to go back and watch all those films again. You know, um, mm. Wake in Fright, Razorback, Mad Max 2 was the one that was located in Silverton, yeah. one, one in Victoria and three, who cares. Um, but two was fantastic, you know. Um, two is just a really uh, incredible film and I, I always got that kind of post-apocalyptic sort of reading of those those spaces uh, anyway but I think that the, the the cinema is like a tradition out there now it just reinforces all that mm. in fact I'm not even sure if I can separate the cinematic kind of memory and any kind of immediate response to those spaces mm. I, I, don't, I think it's just welded in there it's, it's almost preempts uh, I think it almost preempts your experience of those places anyway because when I went out to Broken Hill and Silverton for the first time probably about 10 years ago I too was familiar with Mad Max and you know we got the yeah. movies that and you know growing up in the UK I mean we don't just do not have a landscape like yeah, that anyway sure. yeah um, and it's almost uh, it's difficult to even look at that landscape without bringing with it I think that baggage that you do from, yeah, yeah. from popular culture. Yeah, sure, yeah. I guess I was courting it through the projects. I mean, obviously staging, you know, uh, a performance out there, you, you, you're already attracting those kind of readings. So, mm. um, but it was it was kind of like a fine line because I, I didn't want to sort of, um, you know, 
make a fan work about these films. It was kind of like uh, thinking about them on my own terms. So actually, stylistically, my projects are, are almost diametrically opposed to the editing or the mm. presentation of these Mad Max films, which of course George Miller is so famous for these kind of incredible jump cuts and um, hard cuts and uh, a very dramatic sound effect, uh, sound, soundtrack rather. And, and my, my work were really long, slow, attenuated, protracted takes, you know, they, um, they were about meditating and even boredom, you know, or, or getting the chance to look at every bit of detail that's scrolling by very slowly rather than a, a standard sort of, you know, one second, one and a half second kind of Hollywood style cut. So, so, um, so I took it in, into a different space, but, but I was just experimenting, not really knowing if it was working or not. But, but, but one thing I knew was that the space itself was so powerful that um, really it didn't matter what was taking place in terms of human drama out there, the space was so dramatic. It's almost like um, you can't fight the location because it's always going to win. That, that location is just um, is so kind of overpowering. And I think that's why I felt like intoxicated by it. I really... Also, I, I think that it's wrong to, to just make those recent cultural references because I was aware that there's 60,000 years of occupation out there and that's the real history, you know, that, that's where I feel like, for me, the real mystery is of the, that, yeah, that you're kind of observing like this ancient landscape. What yeah. I was going to ask um, yeah. about the approach to Mundi Mundi is the gesture that you do in yeah. your work. Um, tell me a bit about that. Yeah, I mean... It, it was kind of read in the RA as a as a sort of Christ-like kind of a crucifixion, but actually it wasn't really meant to be that that exactly. I guess I'm open to this kind of free play or whatever. You know, it's it's open. It's not it's not like I'm trying to lock down a reading. And it, and also I, I don't care. It's just my intention as an artist. I privilege the viewers reading anyway. But it was more about the idea of like just trying to balance, and and it and it ends up looking like a like a crucifixion but I, I I would think it's more like being just crucified in space you know rather than having a, any direct reference to sort of um, you know some some theological idea or some transgressive idea or whatever it's not it's not really that um, present within the formulation of the work that's just something that kind of attached itself later but but really probably a more prominent reference was Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man you know because because I was thinking uh, I was interested in this Vitruvian idea of a kind of order balance and symmetry of the human form but how do you demonstrate that well you know I, I would see it illustrated and that's that's fine but to demonstrate it you need a figure who's kind of struggling with um, different kind of gravitational force or whatever you've got like some momentum in there and and for a motorcycle rider, the best way to ensure that you, you're not going to kill yourself um, by taking your hand, hands off the bar is to try and st stabilize the body. So that kind of look mum, no hands kind of scenario is more about um, this kind of testing this Vitruvian idea rather than uh, a kind of Christian sort of deal. When I saw that last uh, week at the Royal Academy, it occurred to me, and this is just an interpretation really, uh, it looks like landing mm. particularly with yeah. the gesture it looks kind of like a an eagle or an airplane you know on yeah. that final approach <laughs> <laughs> which may well just be a, yeah. an unconscious uh, yeah. yeah 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 no absolutely yeah yeah because I think um, being obsessed with uh, aircraft mm. <laughs> it's just like a leading question you know I, I think that yeah no I do I do also I think with uh, sports motorcycles high-powered sports motorcycles you do feel like you're flying because I think at a certain point you realize that you're on this machine that's got these kind of like pneumatic rubber discs under you but the contact point is so small you know and, and you think okay you can kind of get right up into sort of 250 kilometers an hour right up to approaching 300 kilometers an hour in some legally of course on a racetrack of course you wouldn't do that on an open road public road but um, but the contact is so small that you you really feel like it's low-level flying you know it's an incredible experience and then and then um, so the speed is one thing and in that open space but it, but also the idea that you're on the crest of this hill and then descending that hill into the Monday Monday Plains really feels like you're you're approaching 
the ground, you know, and, and that the only thing left to do is to just is to flare before you hit the get the undercarriage on the ground on the tarmac, you know. It really feels like that, and I think um, it's also a fantasy, a kind of Icarus style fantasy of of really trying to imagine yourself flying in those situations, impossible as it is. You still, you know, I don't know, identify with that experience of wanting to be taken away by the kite or or jumping off that balcony and expecting to achieve some sort of distance as a kid or so, you know something kind of primal about it um yeah but it but it but it it definitely is um in the work you know that idea of having the arms as as wings rather than the crucifixion reference um necessarily mm. In, in part of the uh, interpretive information from the RA show, they also place it very strongly in a historical lineage with uh, Sidney Nelwyn. Oh, yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah, I think it's interesting because I, I am, of course, obsessed with Nolan. And, and, and I think that I, I do like that idea of like a single figure in, in the desert, you know, like a kind of drifter. Um, and it's not only Nolan. I mean, I, I guess I, I love like the the Western as a sort of genre and film and whatever. Um, and also we have our own sort of cultural stories, you know, uh, that 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 is just now elevated to myth in in Australian um, law or whatever, you know, about these individuals who find themselves out there in small teams sometimes. But I, I do like the, the the representation of an individual trying to deal with that kind of space. Um, and, and it's very old, you know, I, I always make that reference to like, say, Caspar David Friedrich's Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog from 1818, you know, the very, it's like that kind of key piece for romantic, romantic sort of um, landscape, um, you know, this this idea that you, you, it's, you have that single figure trying to, you know, find some sort of relationship or scale with these, these enormous sort of forces or the sublime or whatever. But for, for Nolan, I, I just like the idea that it was done in this kind of like faux naive style and it seemed accessible and and I kind of knew Kelly through Nolan you know he almost kind of monopolized on Kelly as a kind of an image which is wild and so um, the, the idea of seeing Kelly kind of heading off into this kind of open um, sort of like a kind of salt pan but then you can see these like trees in the background which is actually nowhere near Glen Rowan. It's kind of almost like a construction that Kelly gives us just to make it a little bit more dramatic. So I did like the idea that it's constructed as well. Um, and you see that you see that, that there's a kind of a weird transparency going on with the helmet, which is that kind of flatten, flattened sort of square form. It was just it's just an incredible image. I'm kind of haunted by it. I, and I guess it's so famous now that we, as a as a an art student in a suburban public school in Sydney I was sort of tortured with that image <laughs> they sort of somehow beat it into you but I'm I'm not interested in just trying to like react against it you know in some kind of iconoclastic way I'm I'm I want to work with it I'm, I'm I think it's uh it's incredible it took me a while to work out how incredible it is you know I, I think um especially that kind of the idea of the image slot with the the helmet kind of giving us a reading of the sky and behind so it's, it's really a kind of a, a kind of armor without a body rather than a body without organs kind of thing you know it's really it's really complex 